Today's tutorial is on the exclusive listing contract with the revision date of 121621. And here to present it is Val McNeil, who is the Forms Committee Chair for 2022. I'll go ahead and explain our exclusive listing agreement. Thank you, Susie. So our exclusive listing agreement, I'm going to go over how to fill this out. Um, on the very first line, you're going to put every single seller that is on the deed of the house in which you're going or property in which you're going to be selling. And then you're going to be giving your sellers going to be giving your brokerage the uh, right to list this property. And then you're going to put the broker's address on the located at line. And then the sellers give uh, they're selling real property located at that's the line in which the property is located. You're going to want to find the volume and page number of that property also located in the deed. And most importantly, how much are you going to be listing their property for? In the contract section, this section will be effect on the date that it's either signed by all parties at the end of the contract, or you can choose a very specific date in which you're going to start representing your seller. The type of listing contracts, this is important. Is it gonna be an exclusive right to sell listing in which the seller is obligated to pay commission to the broker even if the seller sells the property? Or is it gonna be an exclusive agency listing in which the seller retains the right to sell the property themselves without any obligation to pay the broker? So in most cases, you're gonna fill out the top one, the exclusive right to sell listing. The broker commission. So during the terms of the contract, whenever you've got a, a willing and able buyer, um, you are going to discuss with your seller what they're going to pay you for commission at closing. So you're going to come up with a commission amount, and then you are going to most likely split that commission one way or another with a co-op broker, in which case you would put the percent in which you're going to pay that cooperating broker if they bring, bring a buyer. Then down below that, we're gonna talk about the seller further agrees that the broker shall be entitled to commission if the property is sold by the broker, the seller, or anyone else within a certain amount of days after the expiration date. Known as a protection clause. Correct. And this protects you to make sure you get paid if for some reason it does go under contract after the fact, unless of course they do sign another contract with another broker, in which case you do not collect the commission. So the seller warrants, what kind of mortgages do they have on the property? Do they have any liens? Typically they'll have a first mortgage lien, but they may not if they own the property outright. Do they have a home equity line of credit on the house? Do they have any tax liens or maybe other water, sewer, sidewalk liens? This is where you're gonna fill out that information. The marketing of the property. Are they going to make it active on the day that it's signed? Um, perhaps um, they're ready to go right then and there, in which case it goes on the MLS within 24 hours, and then you can start bringing in clients to see it, buyers to see it. Um, do they want their name public? Do they want their address public, their phone number? Do they want the property address made publicly available? In most cases, yes, you need to be able to find the house. Um, do they want to exclude it from the IDX websites? Most likely they do not. They want as many eyes on this property as possible. So it's always encouraged to not exclude it from the IDX websites. Delayed listing. This is if your seller perhaps is not ready for it to go live on the market. Maybe they have painting to do. Maybe they want to clean out their house and put stuff in storage before you start bringing potential buyers to the house. So they can choose a day that they want to go active. This date can be changed at any time if they're ready to market it sooner or perhaps they need a little bit more time. It's very important that they know that if it goes under a delayed listing, you cannot market that property. You can't put it on the MLS. You cannot bring any buyers to the property. You cannot present any offers. A coming soon is a little bit different where you can pre-market the property up to 14 days before it goes active on the MLS. So again, maybe they have a little bit of cleaning that they want to do, prep, house prep before you physically list it. Or create a buzz about the maybe, property. Maybe create a buzz about the property. The only difference, again, with this one is you cannot show the property if it's incoming soon. 
and you cannot present any offers to your sellers if it's a coming soon. And also, you can't change the go active date. So once you have the coming soon in there, you've got to stick to the date that's on the coming soon. And not accept any offers during that time. Correct. You can also choose to withhold the listing if they feel like they don't want anyone to know that they're selling their house publicly. You are allowed to take the listing and show potential buyers. However, you cannot put it on the MLS if it's withheld. You have to wait a full 30 days before they can change their mind and start marketing on the MLS. And honestly, if it goes on the MLS, again, thousands of agents will see that listing and they have a better chance. What of are some examples property. of when this um, would be checked off the withhold listing? Well, maybe, maybe they're a local celebrity and maybe they don't want people being looky loose and, you know, driving up to their house and staring at it, or, you know, they're very private people. That could be an example of why you would withhold the listing. Great. The listing content. This is where the seller acknowledges and agrees that you can take photography, maybe drone footage, videos, recordings of the property. If you do a live stream, stream at an open house, you have to get permission from your seller in order to do that. The dis oh, and then the seller represents and warrants that the broker um, and the selling listing content and the license granted to the broker and the selling listing contract does not violate um, upon the rights, including the copyright rights. So you want to make sure any photography you're allowed to use and the seller is warranting that. And the MLS now requires us to put that information in there. If it's our pictures or if it's a professional photographer's pictures, we have to tell the MLS that. Very good. Uh, disclosure of material defects. When you're meeting with your sellers, you're going to present a bunch of forms to them. There is the disclosure of lead-based paint. They will be filling that form out by federal law um, if the house was uh, built before 1978. Um, Connecticut residential property condition disclosure. This is for properties that are not bank owned or not an estate. Your sellers will be fill, filling that information out. Telling not you, you right? Not, not you. The agent broker. never fills it out. Your sellers have to fill this out themselves to the best of their knowledge. They do not want to hide any material defects whatsoever. They want to be open and honest about what is potentially wrong with their house. Then there is the residential foundation condition report. This report, per the general statutes, from 1983 through 2015, there are some cases of crumbling foundations. This particular form should be filled out, particularly by a bank for a bank owned property that doesn't um, have any knowledge or has never lived in the property. All other properties that are lived in by the seller, being sold by the seller directly, should be filling out the concrete advisory form, and that would be located in the other. Forms. Although that is optional, just it, like the mold disclosure. It is optional. Yes, as well as the mold disclosure. You can put that in the other section. Perfect. Permits. Very important that a seller acknowledges that either one, the seller has no knowledge of any structural modifications or improvements to their property that was performed without permits, or the seller is aware of open permits or unpermitted improvements and agrees to go ahead and try to obtain those permits from the town hall, or the seller is aware and is not willing to close out any open permits. Let your sellers know that this could cause substantial delays in their closing. They may not be able to close at all. So it's very important to go through them, the permitting process. Signs. Your broker may or may not place a marketing sign in on the property. Again, you've got to get permission from your sellers. They may not want a sign in their yard simply because they don't want their neighbors to know, or maybe they don't want people stopping in front of their house and looking at it from the road. Or maybe their community doesn't allow it. Correct. Um, and then of course, there's going to be special instructions of sign placement. Maybe they have a very specific location they want you to put it because they've got sprinklers in the yard and they don't want you to puncture their sprinklers. So talk to your sellers about that. 
entry and control of the property, the seller and the brokers agree that the seller shall at times have to have control over the property in order to show that property. Is that seller going to allow you to put a lockbox on the property? They may or may not want you to have a lockbox for security reasons. Um, are they going to give you a key, et cetera? How are you going to enter their property? And then they're going to give you showing instructions. Maybe there's only certain days of the week they want you to show their house. This is where you'd fill out that information. Audio and video surveillance. The seller acknowledges that the use of audio and video equipment to record or eavesdrop is governed by both federal and state laws. So surveillance equipment, they have to tell you, do they have audio equipment? If the seller understands in advance that they need consent to the parties that are being audio recorded, video recorded, or with audio recording or live streamed. They have to make it prominently displayed on their house at the point of entry that there is audio or video surveillance in use, or maybe they don't have any. <laughs> Dual agency, you have to also get permission from your sellers. You may have an open house and maybe you get a buyer at the open house that's not represented by another real estate agent and maybe they want to put an offer in on your seller's property. You have to explain what dual agency is and what it means for both the seller and the buyer in the transaction. Offers. The so seller acknowledges that um, until closing, the broker shall present the seller with any offers, whether they're written, verbal, counter, or backup offers. A buyer rep may participate in the pre presentation of the offer to the seller if the seller shall allow it, or maybe the seller does not want a buyer's agent to present an offer to them directly. So you have to ask them permission. In response or inquiries about the existence of other offers, buyers um, or cooperating brokers, the broker shall or shall not disclose the existence of offers. And that's per the code of ethics versus B is per the MLS. Yep. Marketing after execution of the purchase and sale agreement. So when a seller has signed the purchase and sale agreement to the property, the broker can change the listing to under deposit if they change it to under deposit, the sellers need to know that the marketing stops completely. An agent is no longer obligated to continue to market the property to try to get more offers. Or they can change it to continue to show in which you're still allowed to show that property and you're still allowed to accept backup offers. It's very important that your seller contains or has property insurance not only for when buyers are in the house, but if for some reason something happens during the inspections or perhaps even during the appraisal portion of the property, it's important to be insured just in case. Liquidated damages upon default by the buyer. In the event that the buyer does default um, on the obligations under the purchase and sale agreement and forfeits their deposit monies, the seller needs to know they can keep it as liquidated damages, whether by agreement of the buyer or otherwise, and the broker and shell sellers shall share equally in those liquidated damages. Under 16, when we're talking about additional agreements, maybe you and your sellers have agreed that you'll reduce your commission, perhaps if you take on a buyer in a dual agency, um, or there's maybe other provisions in there that you and your sellers have discussed that pertain to their property, maybe showing only on certain days, et cetera. This is where you'd put that information. Counterparts and electronic signatures, we have to get permission from the sellers in order to transmit maybe a document via email for signature, et cetera. So this is where you'd put your information and of course your seller's information. Um, for the electronic signatures. And then the contract um, enforcement. This is where the bro broker may enforce the contract against the seller. If the seller does not cooperate with the broker, maybe your seller isn't allowing you into the property to show it to potential buyers. Maybe the seller is not allowing you to hold open houses in order to sell your property. Um, and they're being very difficult, unfortunately, in uh, your obligation to them in order to sell the property. So you can terminate the contract if um, you know that ends up happening. 
uh, the broker discovers that the seller is unable to perform. And then, of course, we have all the uh, general statutes section. So the contract is subject to the general uh, Connecticut general statutes prohibiting discrimination in commercial and residential real estate transactions. Seller has certain obligations um, to um, disclose lead. The real estate brokerage may be entitled to certain lien rates on the property. And then for the purpose of providing notices under this agreement, the term buyer shall mean buyers, buyer's agent or buyer's attorney, and the term seller shall mean the seller, the seller's agent or the seller's attorney. And at the very end of this contract, all parties to the contract sign. And uh, also, we just want to make sure that uh, if uh, you or your sellers uh, don't fully understand it, to please seek the advice of an attorney. Neither me or Val are attorneys. So although we've just explained this exclusive listing agreement to you, uh, always seek the advice of an attorney if you're not sure about any of these paragraphs. Val, thanks for explaining this contract Thank today and uh, happy selling. Thank you.